Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Terra for Chua. And oh man, this is so in my wheelhouse. This is exactly what I love to see. A game full from start to finish with agonizingly um, tough decisions to make. Everyone a compromise between doing X or Y. Gambling on future that you can't 100% be sure of. Pivoting when you need to because things didn't quite work the way you gambled. Or, you know, exalting when you get that perfect card to fill into that perfect slot. Uh, to trigger that perfect combo of the engine that you have been developing throughout the entire game. Terra Fertua has that in spades. That is the definition of the gameplay from start to finish. Because of a couple of really brilliant design decisions. Um, one, or s uh, several, so many. One, the in the really strict restriction to you are making a 3x3 three three grid. That's it. That so uh, limits you, and you have to be so smart about how you are, what you're doing right now to for those first baby steps, um, but that directly affects what you're going to do at the end of the game, because of the next brilliant thing, these in-game scoring and more importantly, activation cards. That once the game is over and you've made your grid, you are going to get to activate certain cards for like a super big, amazing combo bonus. And you have to be building from the very first turn with that in mind so that you can get the most out of that final super production phase. And you've got two to choose from. And you might pick, I mean, you know, and they often are very, very different. And okay, you go for this one, but then, oh, I have to put something in that spot that I will not want to activate at the end of the game. Is it too late to pivot to this one. Oh, I could. I mean, And so you're trying to build with both those in mind. But then you're also trying to build because you're going to score one of these two things at the end of the game too and get potentially uh, the majority of your points that way. Uh, potentially, if you have built smartly. But, so, um, you've got these things just breathing down your neck from the get-go. And these are brilliant. Um, the way that you can combine them and the way they force you to um, build towards their needs. and um, But then on top of that, I mean, this game, I, if, if the developers have not played Glenn Moore, uh, well, I got to doff my cap to them even more for being creative geniuses, because this really owes a lot to one of the greatest tile lane games of all time. In Glenn Moore, uh, players are building their own little grid of stuff. They're putting tiles down. And in that game, the idea was, hey, when you put a tile down, you activate it and everything that's directly adjacent to it. Terra Fertua, super charges that and said, oh, you activate that and everything in the row and the column. So at the beginning of the game, that doesn't sound like much because you don't have a lot. But as the game goes on and you make a bigger and bigger section, every time you play a card, you're going to be activating one, two, three, four, five, you know, a ton of cards. Um, again, you want those super activations to be super chain combo-tastic. But you had to be building from that from the get-go. Because um, there's nothing worse than laying that card down and, oh, that card, I don't have the resources to activate it. I'll still activate all these other ones, but that'll just sit fallow. Those kinds of... But, you know, maybe that's for the best anyway, because the one that's not using, I didn't need it for my end goals regardless. I was ultimately just going to convert that using a converter or whatever it might be. Um, very, very impressive. Um, and, you know, probably the thing that impresses me most about this game, uh, for a two-player game, this is under a half an hour. This is like a 20 to 30 minute game. Um, um, but that is 20 to 30 minutes totally jam-packed of just non-stop crunch as you're trying to figure out. Because, uh, I mean, I love that this is a, a great combination of tactical and strategic play. you got to make these short-term moves because this market of what you have access to is constantly changing. Um, but you've got to keep your end goals in mind. You've got to balance all of these things. And it is tough. Uh, it is tension-filled, and it is exciting. Now, I've only played this as a two-player game. It would be interesting to play it as more because, of course, in a four-player game, or I think the game goes to five, if I recall correctly. Is that true? I probably should have looked at that. Yeah, it goes up to five players. Of course, it becomes even more tactical because the market is radically changing from turn to turn, especially because players are like, look, I can't find what I want. Okay, I'll dump the thing and slide on over and hopefully get what I want. So you pretty much um, have to assume that um, after you take your turn, what you see there is not going to be there when it eventually comes back around to you. And maybe that's an issue. I don't know. I don't tend to play. This should be in that deck. I uh, only play it two-player. And as a two-player game, um, we felt 
It's actually interesting. We didn't really need that often to use the, okay, I'm just going to try to clear something out because I'm looking for something particular. I assume that's there for uh, more players. You're like, oh, I don't like any of those. What I wanted is long gone. I'll trash something to move around uh, and, and, and try to get something that'll work for me. There is a, a there is a healthy dollop of luck in this game. Make no mistake. And I imagine that is exacerbated at a higher player count. Um, but I don't mind because... Again, this is a quick, quick game. I mean, the rules say at full players, it goes up to 40 minutes. That's probably less than an hour. And I, I can believe that to be the case. Um, but I, I, and I would happily play this at a higher player count. But oh my gosh, as a two-player game, Jen and I were both super impressed. Uh, really enjoyed it quite a bit. Really about the only problems I can think of. There's two. One... An unfortunate design decision to go for green and red for two very, very important elements. And colorblind players don't know the difference. That's, I mean, th th these should be blue or purple or something. That was a big, big goof on the designer's part or the developer's part. Also, I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of got mixed feelings about this. The game comes with a bunch of tuck boxes that you uh, make for all the different, I mean, for people who really like to, to you know, put everything into individual silos. I like just having a big old pile of stuff. It makes it easier to set up and clean up. Um, but it came with these. And, I mean, I, it's fine, but the, 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 it just strikes me as odd. For a game that has a fundamentally green message. I mean, there's a whole afterward talking about the hidden costs of, of international transportation of goods and, um, you know, trying to manage pollution, because that really is... I mean, in addition to all the mechanisms I've talked about, the game has such a great message about trying to make a better future for ourselves. Because, yeah, you could just say to heck with pollution. I don't care about pollution management at all. I'm just going to try and generate, and you will lose. Because it's such a simple, elegant... Um, you know, way to contain a message and mechanisms. If I generate pollution and I don't have any place to put it, it will just take my industry offline. I can't run anymore because, you know, the more we pollute this planet, the less we can get out of it. So we do have to build smart. That is the key to winning. And, you know, the, the, the game posits acknowledging that, um, you know, there will always be byproducts of what we do, um, but if we can build smarter and, um, you know, work that into our chain, those costs, uh, that we will come out ahead. Everybody will come out ahead. So I love that fundamental message, which again, is uh, you know, gone into in depth in a nice little afterward from the developers. That's fantastic. But if that's the case, why are these here? I mean, this is just extra production. Now, to be fair, fortunately, they're not plastic tuck boxes uh, because, oh my gosh, we don't need to plastic tuck boxes anymore. So they're nice. You know, they, they came from... They, they don't have any spot UV on them anymore. By the way, if you haven't seen um, her, go check out One Pip Wonders channel. I'll put a link for her down in the show notes. She's done several videos talking about how we, as a board game industry, can be more sustainable in our production methodologies. And um, I think she would... Uh, she, she'd call them to task for this. This was not necessary. Necessary, but um, still, on the whole, Terra Fruchua is a fantastic design. It's a fast playing, incredibly tension filled, uh, fun uh, romp from start to finish. This has every chance of making it in my top 10 games of the year because, oh man, this ticks all the boxes. Jen and I could sit down and play this back to back two or three times, get very, very different games depending on the strategies we pursue. Um, and man, I, I just cannot stress enough how brilliant the combination of tactics and strategy because of these cards is I am very, very impressed with Terra Fortura. And that was the run-through, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.